So welcome panelists. Thank you all for joining us uh, from your different corners of Iowa and probably all over the US. Um, so what I'd like us to do and what I'll do is I'll kind of, uh, you know, give you a shout out by name, um, have you guys uh, kind of introduce yourselves and then we'll just get going with questions and people can kind of chime in when they would like to. So um, I'm just gonna go on the order that I see you in my screen, which means Dr. Musser, you're up first. So for all of our panelists, um, what we'll do is we'll um, introduce, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, um, talking a little bit about your role at Iowa State, whether that's faculty or student, um, and then a little bit about what you, what brought you to vet med, um, specifically or to the profession, um, but also specifically to Iowa State. Um, and then if you'd like to share an AIMS thing that you enjoy, whether that's uh, in our physical and social distancing uh, situation right now or outside of it, something that you, you know, recall fondly from uh, a few months ago, uh, that would be fantastic too. So your name, your role, what brought you to vet med, uh, and then something about AIMS that you enjoy. So Dr. Musser, I'll let you take it away. Perfect, thank you. So I'm Meg Musser. I'm one of the faculty oncologists here at Iowa State. I grew up in Ohio, went to the University of Illinois for vet school, did my internship at VCA West Los Angeles and my residency at North Carolina State. I then spent three years in private specialty practice up in Connecticut before joining Iowa State just about three years ago. So I've, like probably many of you, always wanted to be a veterinarian since I can remember. I thought about other career paths and none of them really kind of sparked the interest for me like veterinary medicine does. And I really wanted to be an oncologist because I really like the biology of cancer. I find it really interesting. And on the clinical side, I like to get to know my patients really well. We see our patients once a week or once a month for a very short period of time. And so we really get to know them and their families in a lot of detail. And it's, it's really that bond that I like. Right now, it's a little bit more difficult with social distancing, but we're still building those bonds, which I enjoy. Ames and Iowa State worked out for me for my family specifically. My husband is a math professor, and so both of us were able to finally be in the same place after 10 years of dating by coastally. So now we're in the same spot, which is great. Um, and Ames is just really lovely. I told myself I would never come back to the Midwest after leaving Ohio, and yet I find myself really enjoying Iowa, the community here, both at Iowa State and the vet school, and Ames itself is just really um, a nice place to live. And in terms of things I like in Ames, when the weather is nice, there are lots of rails to trails. So if you bike or if you run, there's a lot of really great outdoor activities to do in Ames. Great, thank you, Dr. Musser. Uh, Dr. Gordon, you're up next. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Iowa State Open House. Um, I'm a 1993 Iowa State graduate. Um, and when I left Ames, I said I would never come back and be in faculty in any vet school. Um, I practiced in private practice for 14 years in Wisconsin and Arizona, and I exclusively do dairy work, dairy cows. Um, in 2007, I was recruited back to Ames to come back and practice in our um, large animal field services unit, um, serving clients in Iowa, primarily in, in, in uh, taking students out with me on farms, doing large animal or dairy work um, in, in central and western Iowa. Um, so I've been back here now for almost 13 years. Um, I also um, do quite a bit with milk quality and drug residue um, type research. Um, and so I've found an interest in that um, through, the, through the years. Um, Ames is a great location to live uh, for us as a family, um, good school systems, and it's close to our parents in Western Iowa. So I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, just a hometown boy here. Um, but it's, it's got a lot going on for it. It's um, very close to Des Moines um, in order to get a little bit more activities, uh, a lot of sports, uh, college sports with relatively decent college sports teams here in Ames. Um, so in, in Iowa, it's one of the nicer towns to be able to live in. Um, I think that's about all for now. 
Great, thanks, Dr. Gordon. Uh, Jody, you're ne you're up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Palama. I'm from Northwest Iowa. I grew up on a beef cattle farm, but I want to practice small animal medicine, much to my father's dismay. I went to South Dakota State for my undergrad, and I applied to all of the Midwest schools, but Iowa was my top choice and my in-state school, so it made sense financially. Um, some things I like about Ames include all the bike trails. My husband recently bought a bike, and we go biking on those a lot. And I also live in the trailer court by the vet school, so I really like walking my dog with the puppy gang in the trailer court. Great, thank you. Bianca. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm Bianca. I'm a second year, um, I guess almost third year now student. Um, I'm originally from Orlando, Florida. I did my undergrad at the University of Central Florida and also got a master's there. Um, I am interested in small animal medicine, possibly dabble in some exotics and wildlife. Um, Ames is a very much very much a college town. Um, I came from Orlando, which is a huge city, and my undergrad has 60,000 students attending, um, so it was very much a big change for me. I jumped in with both feet, had never been to Iowa or the Midwest or Ames um, before I came here, so it was very different experience, but I wouldn't change it. Um, Iowa State called me because, called to me because uh, one, I got in, <laughs> and two, it was also financially the best option for me based on um, a couple of the other schools that I got into. Um, and Ames is a college town, which I love because my undergrad is very big football school, so I do love um, tailgating and going to games uh, when, when I can. Um, and there are a lot of nature trails to walk. Um, there is one park here, Ada Hayden, around a huge, beautiful lake. I love going there. Um, just going around the trail one time, it takes walking like an hour. So um, you can get a lot of exercise and fresh air here. Um, and it's just, everyone's really nice. Uh, coming from, again, Orlando, that's not the case. A lot of big urban cities, um, especially out of the Midwest. So uh, I think if you got in and you choose to come here, then you're making the right decision. Great, thank you, Bianca. Maya. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, my name is Maya. I'm a first year at Iowa State. Um, I did my undergrad at Cal State University in Northridge. I'm also from Los Angeles, California, which like Bianca is a big city compared to Ames. So coming to Iowa was a big difference and big change for me, but I also did the one year biomedical science master's program at Iowa State two years ago. So that was my first introduction to Ames. So I kind of got to experience what Ames and the school was like before vet school. And that's basically what solidified my decision to come to Ames. I fell in love with the city, the people, the, it's weird to say, but the culture, I guess, it's different there. Everyone is nicer. Everyone's more willing to help. Um, and I just really enjoyed that where I could go anywhere and it was just a happy in, in environment, happy experience. Whereas back home, if I go and make eye contact with anyone, they're like, what are you staring at? What are you looking at? And I feel like at the vet school, everyone is willing to help one another. I've had help from VM2s and VM3s that I don't personally know. And they're like, oh, you have this professor, let me help you. They like to ask questions that come out of their study guides, or they like to ask questions from their lectures that are under the pictures. Make sure you know that. So I really like that aspect of the school. Great. Thank you. Hey, guys. I'm Kenzie Johnson. I'm a VM3. Um, I'm originally from Des Moines, so I've grown up in Iowa my entire life. Um, I went to Iowa State for undergrad and majored in animal science. Um, I chose Iowa State because, I mean, I wanted to, I was that person who was five and always wanted to be a vet, and um, so I worked a lot with clinicians in my hometown, and they were all Iowa State grads, and I always saw how great of clinicians they were, how friendly, how intelligent, um, you know, they really were good at their craft, and so I always felt that Iowa State was a really good option for me because I saw the doctors that they were making um, and I felt comfortable getting that education. I did apply out of state 
but um, you know, I love my family. I like being relatively close, but not too close. Um, and the financial, you know, in-state tuition was definitely a bonus as well. Um, in Ames, I like to do like walks around the trailer park, which is where I live as well. Um, and just be outside, sit on my deck and study instead of inside all the time, so. Great, thank you. Okay, Kieran, are you back with us? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. All right, sorry about that. Um, so I'm a current VM2 uh, student at Iowa State. Um, my path, uh, I guess, to vet med was a little bit different. Oh, sorry. Um, mixed animal uh, interests, predominantly large animal. My path to vet med was a little different than most. Most people, like, you know, they want to be a veterinarian since they're a little kid. Um, but me, I came into undergrad as an engineer and quickly switched out of that. And then I didn't discover really the field of veterinary medicine until about two years later. Um, so it was a pretty new, new occurrence to me. Um, I didn't really you know, fall into it until I got a job at a veterinary clinic and I was like, this is definitely what I want to do. Um, I'm from Eastern Iowa, I did my undergrad at the University of Iowa. I have a picture of, you know, Kinnick Stadium right there. So the, the wrong side of Iowa, some may say. Um, but I got my degree in biology uh, and then immediately after uh, undergrad, I got into Iowa State and came here. Um, kind of the reasons why I chose Iowa State is because it was in-state for me, so financially that was the best option for me. Um, and also a lot of other schools I applied to, I was either denied or waitlisted, um, and so I just figured, you know, rather not wait, just kind of go with the, go with Iowa State uh, for that. As far as activities around Ames, um, usually to kind of get a nice study break, uh, I'll go to the one of rec centers, you know, work out or like everyone said, there's tons of trails around, so go out on a walk. Uh, I've uh, recently adopted a greyhound who's passed out in the corner of my room right now, so I uh, like taking her on walks, uh, and, you know, and if weather doesn't cooperate, then inside, you know, either work out at home or cooking or something. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you guys uh, again for joining us. We'll hop right into uh, some of our questions um, in the Q&A box. Uh, the first one um, is about part-time jobs. So Jessica wants to know, for students, um, how do you manage with a part-time uh, job um, during school? And then um, after the students kind of answer uh, Dr. Muster and Dr. Gordon, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how students might get involved um, in the clinics or in, in field services um, as well. So keep that, keep thinking about that. But students, uh, what do part-time jobs look like for you? Um, so I work one to three days a week at an emergency clinic in Des Moines. Um, I originally got that as like a summer gig, um, but I chose to stay on. And so I've been lucky enough to get to experience some real, real life, you know, um, cases that we'll see that we talk about in school. And so that for me, work is kind of my escape. Um, it's out of Ames. It's with new people for the most part. Um, and I think that that kind of rejuvenates me for the rest of the week to be, you know, studying. It reminds me why I'm in vet school. It, you know, it allows me to see the cases we talked about in our, for example, small animal medicine class. Um, and just, you know, re, like gives you more energy for the rest of the week to finish strong. I also work at the clinic where Kenzie works part time. Uh, she works a little more than I do, but I would recommend the first semester and maybe the first year to kind of ease into it without a job, maybe. Um, it was a big transition for me from undergrad to vet school, and it's harder than you think it's going to be. So that first year, it's kind of nice to settle in, and then the notoriously hardest semester of vet school is your fall semester of your second year. So after that is when I started working. I started working spring semester of second year, and then ever since then through the summer, it's been part-time one or two days a week. Um, I'll piggyback off of that. So um, I guess my job at the school isn't a part-time job like Kenzie and Jody have, um, but there are 
a lot of little jobs you can have around the vet school. Um, so for me, I work down um, in the Hills Pet Nutrition Distribution Center. So staff and students, shameless plug for Hills, can order food at a discounted rate for their pets. Um, but there's also different feeding programs like Purina has one, Q and Royal Canaan. Um, but I know people that work down like in the um, rehab center or down in the diagnostic lab. Um, and that is sometimes only like one or two hours a week. Um, so it gives you a little bit of pocket change. Um, also like being an ambassador, um, like some of us are for the school, um, Deanna can get you more information about that if you're interested. Um, so there's little ways to make money that you don't necessarily have to go off campus for as well. You just might have to search for them a little bit more. And I'll kind of go off of what uh, Jody said about kind of easing into it uh, for your you know, first year, first couple semesters at least. Um, I will agree that it was a very large change from someone who, you know, didn't maybe have to study the most in undergrad to uh, basically studying for numerous hours every single day. Um, so that was kind of a, a shock, um, if you will. And so definitely kind of easing into it and getting your, um, getting your kind of time management down first is probably your best, uh, your best bet. Um, as far as jobs, uh, me currently, I am a, a tutor, TA, for first semester anatomy. So that's kind of small animal anatomy, dog and cat, and then second semester large animal. Um, so that's kind of nice for me because it's, you know, the schedule is already made up. So there's only a fixed amount of hours you can work per week, um, but you can kind of go in and help, you know, do some extra time if um, you do want a little bit extra spending money, if you will. Uh, and then as well, it kind of solidifies a lot of the concepts that maybe I've forgotten about. And so I'm like, oh yeah, that's where, you know, that structure is or something. So it's kind of a nice review uh, as I'm going through it as well. So kind of a, kind of two sides to that, I guess. Going off of what the others have said, I have some classmates because I'm also a first year. So I know last semester we did have some classmates who worked for the first, I think, two or three weeks and they quickly realized that they were not able to handle both the curriculum and a job and studying and trying to navigate and figure out how to work. But then on the beginning of this semester, I do have some classmates who work in the bookstore during lunchtime. So that's convenient for them that they don't really need to go anywhere and they can just sit in the books for one hour, one to two times a week, or they work in the library. So they are sitting there behind the desk and they're still able to study, but they're also making some cash on the side. So that worked in both aspects for them. Great, thank you students. Uh, so faculty members, what does, what do you, uh, students maybe find, um, you know, for jobs in the clinics? What, what do you kind of see um, from students who are, working or hoping for a job? Yeah, I can go first. So um, in terms of the clinics, there are lots of little odd jobs here and there that our students do. I can't remember who mentioned it, but um, our rehab facility is really rocking and they always need students to help with the underwater treadmill and walking dogs around the clinic to get them up and moving after surgery. So a lot of our students come down, again, it's for an hour or two a week to help out with that, but it gets your hands on animals and kind of gets you out of the study mode and for a break for a bit of time. And then we have a summer scholar program. So you can apply to do research with faculty members over the summer. So I had a first year a couple of years ago who did a lot of research with me during that summer. She got paid for it. We got a paper out of it. And so that was a really great experience for her. And then if you have anything specific that you really like, if you really like dermatology or ophthalmology or oncology, go to those faculty members and say, hey, can I at least shadow you on the clinic floor? And then sometimes that rolls into a job opportunity. We opened our radiation therapy unit last February. And last summer we had a student who was shadowing and we needed some help with the anesthesia for radiation. And so she was able to actually fit that role really nicely. She got one-on-one -on -one training with one of our anesthesiologists and had a really great time. So there are things that are always coming up and you just have to ask and look for them. Um, yeah, I can add that. Uh... The odd jobs throughout the hospital and into the ambulatory unit are, are um, quite common. Um, in, in, our, in our ambulatory unit, we have a couple of work-study students. Those are generally undergrads. 
Um, and then a couple of veterinary students who come and just do odd jobs for us. And we kind of let them set their own schedule. Um, it might be a situation where we might need something done and we might call them and just have them come in when they want to. Our biggest job opportunity um, is really summertime work, um, either through the Summer Scholars Program or our department has um, probably 20 to 30 summer internships that are available that are research focused either in Ames or out in, in production units and in all the species. Um, so pretty good immersion in those things. Um, and this summer probably will be a complete loss the way it's looking right now. But in about a month, I would have a couple, three students working on various projects for myself. Um, and those have actually parlayed themselves as uh, has already been said into some kind of a paper or a presentation. Um, and two of those students through those years have actually stayed on as um, in, in graduate programs with me also. So um, there's, there's opportunities if, you, if you're looking to do some summer research and maybe get a little bit of an interest in, in doing some graduate work uh, to do those also. So there's lots of opportunities, especially in the summertime to fill those, um, fill those roles. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a number of questions here. Uh, so I think we'll just kind of try and roll them all into one. Um, but a lot about living with your pets. Um, so do any of you have pets? How do you, you know, what does the living situation look like? What does the veterinary care uh, situation look like for those of you who have pets? Does it work to have pets uh, when you're in vet school? Kieran, I know with your new Greyhound, do you want to start out first? Yeah, I can go ahead and kick it off. Um, so when I came to vet school initially, I just had a cat. Um, and so, you know, a cat doesn't need to be walked. So it was kind of feed in the morning, go to class, come home in the evening, feed, and, you know, hang out with the cat in the evening or whatever. Um, as far as a dog goes, uh, you do need to allow yourself some time to come back and let it out, you know, let it do its business, uh, especially if it's a puppy. I know a lot of people are kind of, once they get a little bit in, into vet school and a little bit more comfortable, they'll adopt like an eight-week-old puppy. And so um, that's something that obviously you'll need to dedicate a little bit more time to. Um, as far as veterinary care, uh, I go to Boone Vet Hospital, um, which is about 20 to 30 minutes west um, of Ames. So I'll take them out there and they're super nice. You know, um, I believe they do give a little bit of a discount to veterinary students. Um, as far as just having the animals around, uh, going through first year when you're going through anatomy, you'll talk, or, talk a lot about different landmarks and structures and probably the best things to the best kind of example to look at those on is going to be your own animals or your friend's animals. Um, so you can kind of go and kind of going through the years as well, practice your physical exams, you know, practice looking at different things, you know, if your animal, you know, unfortunately happens to get some kind of illness or something, you can kind of correlate that along with what you're seeing uh, in classes as well. So I think it, it works really well. Uh, you just need to make sure you have both the time and resources. I'll kind of add on to that. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to have a husband in Aves with me. So if you have a roommate, which a lot of people do, or a spouse with you that they can kind of let the dog out when needed or walk when needed. But also I think that my dog has been a really good reminder that I need to take breaks sometimes too. And getting outside and walking around the block has actually been really good for my studying because I don't get so bogged down in it. And yeah, I go to a local Ames um, vet clinic called Somerset. They have a little discount for students, but anything with emergencies, I had to bring my dog to the ISU emergency once because he got bit after hours. And they also have a 15% discount for students. So they keep it pretty reasonable. And if they know you're a vet student, they kind of talk, talk you through things and their differentials. So it's kind of a fun learning experience too. Hopefully nothing too serious is wrong, but.
Great, thank you. Uh, so we do have a question uh, from Brooke about uh, what the dress code is like day to day. So uh, Maya, do you want to uh, take that over uh, from the student perspective? And then uh, maybe Dr. Musser and Dr. Gordon can talk about the fourth year um, and what that looks like. So Maya, do you want to start out? Um, so dress code day to day, you have to uh, you can't burn leggings or sweats or gym clothes or things that you would wear when you're just hanging out at home basically it's jeans and a sweater or uh, jeans and a casual shirt the business casual is the way the school likes to call it on thursdays we do just business professional which is actually really nice to see everyone show up to school and their nice suits or their nice slacks and you get you can kind of show off that one shirt that you bought for interviews and you never really get to wear again so it's nice to wear that at first, it does take some getting used to and reminding yourself that, oh, it's Thursday, I do need to dress up. But after a while, you actually look forward to it because it's that one day where you get to look nicer and make yourself more presentable. And if you have an exam that day, it kind of makes you feel more prepared for it and like dress well to succeed. Um, but then after hours, I believe around five, you can come to school wearing whatever the dress code doesn't apply at that point anymore. Great. Okay, Dr. Musser, Dr. Gordon, do you want to talk about fourth year? Sure. So on the clinic floor, in the small animal clinic, we do require business casual, so slacks or a skirt, um, blazers, sweaters, that sort of thing. As fourth years, you also wear a smock and you guys choose the color. It's usually maroon or navy, um, but that's to, it's sort of like a, um, a, a white coat, but it's just a colored coat so that the owners know kind of the difference between who are residents and who are students um, and again it's it's just the kind of business casual occasionally we'll have you wear scrubs certainly if you're going into surgery you'll change at the vet school into scrubs to keep that nice and clean but otherwise it's a business casual affair And then in the food animal side or in the hospital the large animal hospital side the majority of that is either if you're in food animal, you're going to be wearing coveralls and boots over, over your shoes. Um, if you're in the hospital, obviously it's 70 degrees, so it's not cold. When you go out into ambulatory um, equine, they generally wear um, khakis and polos. In the food animal side, we're wearing coveralls and boots on our farms. And so we're generally in jeans and work clothes, uh, depending on time, upon the time of the year. In the wintertime, it's plenty of clothes to stay warm in the summertime it's plenty of clothes to stay cool without showing anything off so um it it's really variable in our session we're probably the most laid back as far as that goes great thank you uh so we have a question here um about our class size so um a, i think a lot of students uh, may know that we are the second largest veterinary class uh, we admit the second largest veterinary class um, in the US. Um, and with that, um, they'd like some feedback on um, how, how you guys navigate that. So um, does it feel like your class is big? Are there um, some ways that um, you've kind of found to navigate that, especially in labs? Um, so kind of what does that, that large class look like in relation to, um, to your schooling? How do, how do you think that impacts it? How do you think we've kind of addressed that, either from the faculty side or the student side? So I think, I mean, at Iowa State undergrad, we also had relatively large classes for like, you know, the chemistry, but animal science was relatively small. So I've had the experience of both. Um, I think the biggest factor here is that your professors really care. Um, they really want you to succeed. You got into vet school. You've done the work. You know, at this point, we're all in this together kind of thing. Um, and that's the same with your classmates. You know, cooperation is definitely key here. You're not competing once you're in. Um, so having more people with different backgrounds has actually been very helpful for me coming from a very small animal focused, um, you know, background. People who have exotic experience or have worked with cattle um, has been extremely helpful with some of my classes. Um, and the professors, if you want to talk to them via email or after class, they're always more than willing to make that time for you. 
I also think that I saw a comment about computers and why you purchase them. Um, so I was very anti buying a computer that was required. However, it's been so helpful because the technology that Iowa State is giving you and providing you with, um, these computers are not only you know, typing laptops, but they're also convertible to tablets, which you may not think you use, but for anatomy and your labs is super duper helpful. Um, it also allows you if your computer breaks, the school has loaner laptops immediately available and you're not without a laptop. Um, and they can transfer all of your you know, notes and everything over to that computer. Um, and I think watching like the Echoes Online, you know, is helpful. But coming back, you know, full circle, the communication between the professors and the students and within your classmates is just incredible. You know, everyone is so helpful. Everyone is so nice. You know, everybody cares and wants you to be here. Great, Dr. Musser, Dr. Gordon, do you kind of want to speak from the faculty uh, side of things? Um, how, how does it work having a larger class um, or even larger uh, groups of students on rotations and stuff like that? Yeah, so I teach mostly in the third year. So I start in the really large lecture that everybody attends for small animal medicine. I'm a very small part of that. And so I teach everyone at that point. And I, I would second what Kenzie was saying. It's such a lovely environment to teach in. Everyone is super engaged. Often they're great questions. And so it doesn't really feel like I'm teaching 134, 45 kids. It feels like, you know, we're in a smaller, more intimate setting, which is really nice. And then you also have a lot of electives you can choose as your second and third year. So I teach an oncology elective, which is capped at 25. So we can have really uh, close conversations. There's a lot of group work in that particular elective. Jody um, is there with me now and we're trying to do it from afar, which is a little bit cumbersome, but we're making it work, hopefully. Um, so I, I think it is, it, it, doesn't feel like there's that many people there. And I can't speak to what happens in labs. And um, I don't specifically teach a lab, but on the clinic floor, we also cap our rotations to five students so that we make sure that every student gets to see enough cases through the two weeks and that we can have really in-depth, in-person rounds. And whether that's via Zoom or whether that's in person, hopefully we'll get back to that here soon. Um, and I, I think it's, again, a really lovely environment and I don't feel like it's a detriment. Um, on the, I, I have the same experience in, in third year teaching. We, we our, our food animal medicine course is team taught. And so I get it anywhere from one to four lectures during the year. So I don't get a tremendous amount of exposure to them, but I do have some um, dairy related um, electives that uh, students can take. And I have anywhere from five to 20 students in those. In the rotations, those are generally for our um, food animal rotation in ambulatory, we have four students, um, which that generally means that you're anywhere from one to four instructor to faculty, sorry, instructor to student, or one to one, because we do have four ambulatory trucks. So it's oftentimes that it's a very small uh, ratio from one, uh, for faculty to student and a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, and then we have a fair number of, of Prussian medicine-based rotations, which are also anywhere from four to 20 students. So they, they really get very one-on-one. -on -one. And, and when I'm towards the end of the senior year, I pretty well know my, my students who are interested in, in dairy and, and a lot of the food animal kids, uh, because I also serve as the um, uh, advisor for the food animal, or the bovine club. And so despite the fact that it's pretty large, when it comes down to those individuals who are in your, in your, um, in your area of interest, you get to know them pretty well. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question here about scrubs. Um, so we were talking a little bit about kind of going into surgery and stuff like that. Um, so um, where do you get your scrubs? Do they have them at the bookstore? Is it okay to wear scrubs from kind of outside with different logos? Uh, let's see, Jody or Mackenzie, I know that you guys are just coming out of that, uh, those surgery, um, uh, the 
like big surgery year. Do you guys want to speak to that a little bit? Um, so especially up in your first three years when scrubs, scrubs are required, I don't really think it matters logo based. Um, we, I definitely see people wearing like VCA, you know, things like that. I think in your fourth year, it does matter more, which maybe Dr. Musser and Gordon can confirm or deny that. Um, but it's keeping that professionalism with the university. Um, you, they do have two options of scrubs at the bookstore. They don't fit everybody the greatest, but I did wear them my first couple of years. Um, and there is a really nice place in Des Moines that has scrubs, white coats, everything you would ever need for any medical profession. Um, and they do offer 10% discount for students as well. So for anatomy, your first year and like other labs, your first couple of years, you probably wear scrubs at the most three days a week. Like you don't need like 10 pairs of scrubs, which I kind of bought a lot of scrubs when I first started vet school, not knowing that. So tidbit of advice. Great. Okay, so a uh, question here um, about um, large animal medicine. So do students who are interested in, large, in production of animal medicine feel you get a good exposure to a variety of different species? Who wants to tackle that one? Kieran, you've got it. And then Dr. Gordon, if you want to fill in. Sure. Um, so as far as kind of getting your hands-on experience um, with a lot of the different species, um, you kind of, it's kind of in the electives plus uh, different clubs and anything you kind of go out and seek on your own. Um, and so one of the electives that I'm currently in right now is production animal medicine. Um, and so it's kind of a very broad overview. Um, the first week or so you start covering different production systems. So you go through kind of the basics of what beef does, what dairy does, you know, swine production, everything like that. Um, and then um, kind of going on, like you have the large animal medicine class and everything like that. I haven't taken those, so I can't speak to those as of right now, at least. Um, but as far as student organizations go, that's probably going to be your biggest tool um, to be getting kind of more resources or hands-on experience with those. Um, like we have the bovine club, you know, swine club. Um, I'm involved in the avian club, which we do a lot of poultry um, stuff with that. Um, and kind of all the different um, kind of production systems. Uh, the dairy and beef is kind of wrapped into one with the bovine club. And then, you know, obviously swine and everything is kind of its own thing. And going out on your own. So this past summer, I worked out at the ISU Dairy in the Calf Barn. Um, I was someone who came from a background of zero cattle experience. Um, and so I thought that would be kind of a good kind of way to get my toes wet and kind of learn a little bit more about the dairy industry, which I ended up doing and I was very grateful to have that opportunity. And then I also had reached out in the middle of the year to um, our two poultry extension vets um, and they were, I was lucky enough for them to provide me with some experience, you know, Dr. Sato kind of sent me a text like one weekend and say, hey, I'm going out to a turkey barn in like an hour. Do you want to come? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so it's kind of those things um, where if you really get to know them, they'll, you know, make sure to include you so you can get as much hands-on experience as possible. And then in the summer I worked um, for the ISU poultry teaching farm. So I thought that was, all those are very valuable experiences. So I'll kind of reiterate that. So kind of your electives, your student organizations, and then anything else that you reach out and kind of, you know, get done on your own is kind of your best bet. Um, yeah, I'll fill in uh, a little bit more here. Um, our faculty in, in the professional and medicine side is 55, 55 deep. We're the biggest um, department in the college. And so the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with, with species specialists, uh, as was already mentioned, um, is vast. Um, we very early on in the first year, uh, we try to start identifying opportunities um, through electives. And then at the, um, in May, we generally, we probably won't do it this year. Uh, we have a, a week long course at the 
the week after finals week called clinical foundations. And every day we go out to a different production setting, um, dairy, beef, swine, uh, small ruminants and llamas and poultry um, and, and just get students exposure to basic um, systems, how to handle the animals, doing physical exams. And, and that course is really meant for those students who have no background in the species or no background in food animal medicine at all. Um, we realized that there's fewer and fewer kids coming from farms with farm backgrounds and we need to interest some non-farm background kids into the into the area or into the specialty in order to continue to fill the need for veterinarians as we go forward. Um, the clubs are extensive, the electives are extensive, and we work very hard to try to create learning opportunities for the students both here in Ames um, with our our local uh, university farms, our client farms. We have uh, a large number of animals that are, get, get hauled into our facility in-house. And then um, probably the one of the best opportunities here is also our, what we call preceptorships, which are two week long blocks in the, in the senior year in which you can go into a practice and ride along with a practicing veterinarian. And it's the, the opportunities are from anywhere from uh, small ruminant to to dairy, swine, um, industry, any of those opportunities are, are available and you get, you get the credit for that. Um, and so those are some of our better experiences that are available too. So um, in, in kind of looking at this question and then the, the next question that's listed here about being practice ready in food animal medicine, if you leave here, you're never gonna know, no matter, no matter what's, what you go into, you're never gonna know everything but you should have a very good base to start with. And um, we've had a couple of students who have been hired this year, and I've talked to the people, the practice owners that have hired them, and the feedback that I get is that our students are amongst the most practice ready of anybody they interviewed th throughout the United States. So I think we're getting the exposure they need, um, but certainly we're not able to teach everything in four years. Great, thank you. Uh, that does lead really nicely into the next question. Um, so the next question says, for upperclassmen, do you feel like you are becoming practice ready uh, comfortably? So um, Dr. Gordon, thank you for talking about the production animal medicine side of things. Um, Dr. Musser, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, small animal side of things? Uh, how do you, you feel students um, are you know, prepared kind of coming into clinics that clinical year? Yeah, so I think in general, most of our students come in with a really good knowledge base. It's just that fourth year getting the hands on. You've talked about these anatomical structures, you've talked about lymph nodes, but actually finding them on a day to day basis can be really tricky. So, certainly, my oncology rotation is an elective, so we encourage everybody to take it, even if they are food, animal, or mixed track, and just because a lot of the kind of physical exam skills are the same that you're going to need uh, throughout your career. But our fourth year does focus on internal medicine, surgery, and ICU, because that's when you're going to get the most exposure to the most variety of diseases that you might see out in your career. In surgery, um, I think there's a misconception that you're going to come onto clinics and surgery and actually do a TPLO or do you know an abdominal explore, and that's often not the case. But you're there, you're learning, you're helping, you're holding, you're getting quizzed as you're doing that. And so surgery across the board at any veterinary school is probably the the thing that doesn't get as much hands-on experience for, but that's where it comes in, getting a really good mentorship in your first job out or doing an internship. I didn't get a ton of training in surgery when I was in vet school and I did a ton in my internship, which definitely convinced me I never want to hold a scalpel again. Um, but that's where that training sort of comes in. But a lot of the forming a differential diagnosis list and getting a physical exam done and being able to do all of that on the fly in ICU and internal medicine, I think you're really prepared pretty well for that. Great, thank you. Uh, so I was gonna ask Jody and Kenzie as you guys are heading into fourth year here in uh, just a little while, do you guys wanna talk about kind of how prepared do you feel for that? Yeah, I'd love to add on to that. Um, so as mentioned earlier, I work in an ER in Des Moines, just like one day a week. 
And seeing the transition in myself from like second year is when I started working. And then after our big seven credit small animal med class, the first semester of third year, you learn so much more. And like the cases coming in, I know the right questions to ask now. And yeah, the doctors would say like, go add some potassium to that IV bag. And I'd be like, okay, I'll do it. But I don't know why. But now it's like, I know why. I know why that animal is losing potassium. I know the mechanism behind it. I know how that fits with that animal specific disease. So it's really fun to see that transition. And I'm really excited to go into fourth year with that knowledge base. So I I feel very well prepared. Obviously, I don't know everything and I won't even when I graduate, but I'm excited for fourth year. I would definitely second exactly what Jody said. Um, and along with like the curriculum that Iowa State provides, you know, we've mentioned several times that getting exposure outside of the school um, at clinics, you know, with faculty not in like the curriculum. I mean, everything is preparing you as much as you can be. Get, you just have to kind of be willing to chase it down a little bit. Um, but I think, and I've talked to several of my fourth years who are now doctors and that's insane, good for them. Um, but fourth year, you really start to feel like a doctor. You have that background knowledge and they're just so much more comfortable, you know, towards the end of their fourth year. And I think that's really where the most growth that you feel, you know, becoming a doctor um, happens. And I would just like to tack on on that production animal um, question. Even small animal people, we need that information for boards. Um, everybody is tested on every species on your board exam your fourth year. And I think even with me not having any background at all, I feel so not, I mean, you know, there's always more to learn, but I feel so much more comfortable, you know, for that part of the test. And if someone with a large animal asks me a question, I can answer that with, you know, a little more confidence definitely than I ever would have prior to that school. So it's a really good program. And our large animal class has definitely taught us a lot already and we're not even done with it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so next question um, talks a little bit more about um, school kind of work life balance. Um, so how students, how do you balance kind of your schoolwork, your studying, your time in class with everything else going on in your lives? Bianca, do you want to start us off. It looked like you were reaching for the unmute button. <laughs> yes, my mouse is like, I can't find it half the time. Um, so I will say that it was a very hard transition for me um, coming from undergrad into vet school, or from not vet school, to being in vet school. Um, and the first semester of vet school, I did not allow myself time to do anything but study. I just studied all the time, um, and I actually didn't do as well as someone that studies all the time you think would do. Um, so it definitely is important to take time out, um, force yourself to take time out of your schedule to go outside, walk your dog, um, hang out with your friends or whatever. Um, second semester, first year, and then especially second year um, as a whole does get a lot tougher. I literally forced myself to have a bedtime basically. Like I would not study after like 10 or 10 30 at night which for me I'm a night owl so I know that seems late for a lot of people um but I forced myself to stop at a certain time and either like go watch um, tv or just go to bed because it helped a lot um and especially second year first semester it being like your toughest semester it I did that's the best semester I've had in vet school so far um so it really does make a difference um take time out for yourself um, find something that you like doing, bring it with you to vet school um, and keep at it because it keeps you sane. Um, and then if you are in quarantine like we are now, you have something to do um, when you're stuck at home. So definitely self-care is the word we like to use at the vet school and it's really important. Yeah, I'll tab on to that quick. Um, so I was actually diagnosed with a rare medical condition my second semester of vet school. So I missed between like 10 and 20 days each semester and I've had three surgeries. So whatever, big whirlwind. 
but the professors are amazing with working with you. You know, I try not to schedule doctor's appointments on tests, but if I miss lectures, they're all recorded. If there were points, I get an opportunity to make those up. So there are things that happen in life outside of vet school. And as long as there's an open communication line, the professors and there's other people at the vet school who, who can help you navigate those. Kind of going off of what Bianca said about giving yourself a set time that after 10 o'clock you're done studying, I kind of put that with my own studying, except I tell myself, like I kind of write it into my schedule, okay, from 10 to 11 you are allowed to watch that Netflix show, you are allowed to watch that TV show, you shouldn't feel guilty that you're watching TV instead of studying, and that's something that I think a lot of us are kind of struggling with or were struggling with in that I feel guilty because I'm doing something for like fun as opposed to studying. I should I have an exam in a week. I should study for that. But you're going to burn yourself out if you keep studying, if you don't give yourself that time to literally do nothing except for watch TV or read a book or go on a walk or do something that doesn't involve school. You will burn yourself out if you don't give yourself that opportunity to unwind, to relax. And then you wake up the next day and you're more more ready to take on that that studying or that assignment or whatever you need to get done to succeed. Yeah, definitely. I'm the kind of person who studying is not my favorite thing to do, which I think most of us will agree that is us. Um, I take every single Friday off the full day. Um, I do board games with my friends. We'll go out to dinner. Like we just take the full day of Friday because then you're rejuvenated for Saturday, Sunday when, you know, if you have a test Monday, you can really study, you know, you're fresh, you've had that fun night of, you know, being social, being, thinking about anything but vet school. Um, and yeah, definitely self-care is the number one thing. Um, I definitely let myself get extremely overwhelmed my first year. Um, and I had to, you know, relearn how to study, relearn how, like what I needed to do to make, you know, my experience at vet school better um, not only grade wise, but, you know, just being happy and, you know, not getting too stressed. So find that thing that makes you happy and brings, you know, some joy to your life, whether that's watching The Bachelor or going on a run, like, you know, just keep with it. You know, don't focus so much on school. The degree is important, but you will get it no matter what, like it'll happen. So just take care of yourself. I'll kind of piggyback off of the idea of taking, you know, picking one day a week or, you know, half of that day and having that as, you know, you're, you're basically not allowing yourself to study for that one day. Um, Cause it really does make a difference. Um, when I, you know, my first semester, I was, you know, essentially 24 seven, just studying constantly. And honestly it was miserable. Um, and kind of as I progressed a little bit more, um, my time management got better, but also my study habits. So I was able to study less, but still, you know, get that, you know, grade on exam, still understand as much or more than I was spent, you know, I, I was able to spend one hour on something and know more about it than if I'd spent four hours on it. Things like that, kind of refining your study habits, finding, you know, quick and easy ways to, you know, get concepts down. And I always tell people this, you know, a lot of people are concerned with like, you know, get getting that grade on an exam or something like that. Granted, it is obviously you need to pass. That's kind of a given. Um, but I kind of go with my approach and say you kind of study the material to be able to apply it, and then kind of scoring well on those exams is kind of just a bonus. Because if you know how to apply it, then chances are you're going to be doing well on those anyway. Um, so that's kind of the kind of the take that I use um, going through my studying. And it kind of helps me stay a little bit more sane because, you know, I'm studying it in a cl more clinical aspect rather than just, you know, kind of slamming my head against a couple PowerPoints and trying to memorize everything. So certainly helps. Great, perfect. Okay, so now we have a, a pretty big question. I'm gonna direct it to Maya and Bianca, um, but anybody else can chime in too. Uh, so never having lived in the Midwest, this is from Jessica, um, I'm worried about the weather. 
for example, tornadoes. <laughs> um, so how did you guys adjust to uh, weather in the Midwest? So coming from Southern California, where the weather is either hot or not so hot, and coming to Ames, where we get below freezing and we get into negatives and we get into snow, it was a big change. Learning how to actually appropriately dress for the weather instead of just buying that jacket because it looks cute was a big change for me. Um, driving in that weather also took me some time learning how to maneuver my small Honda Civic through the snow or sleet and ice was also a, it was a, it was a learning experience, but um, it's manageable. You learn how to layer up, you learn what works for you, what gloves work for you, what scarf works for you. In terms of tornadoes, uh, whenever I get the tornado watch notification on my phone, I still freak out. Everyone tells me you have nothing to worry about, you're fine, but you know, I've never experienced a tornado, so I still watch the sky like no, no tomorrow, and I, I'll learn, I'll learn eventually to not take it so seriously, not to, and to calm down. If it, ha if it comes down to a tornado warning, then I'll freak out, but I'm learning. It's a day-to-day day thing. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, in Florida we have hurricanes that you'll know about for days in advance, so you have time to prepare, um, but tornadoes you really don't, um, and we, we did have tornado watches and warnings um, down in Florida, but you know, we just kind of like, oh, well, it doesn't really happen, but here they are a thing. Um, I've never experienced one, I'm not on wood yet, um, but luckily the Midwest has these things called basements that we also don't have in Florida, so you know, my understanding is you just find a basement, get in it, and hope for the best. Um, the cold definitely was a huge adjustment. Um, last winter was really, really bad here. Um, but, you know, just talk to people that know what it's like. Um, ask, you know, what's the best way to dress? Um, where's the best place to shop? Um, my, or I guess now third year contact um, gave me really good advice on where to go to get clothes, um, what places have discounts for Iowa State students to get winter clothes. Um, I just stocked up on those, you know, got boots. Um, I also drive a small Honda Civic, which uh, driving was a challenge, um, but you know, the first snowfall that actually happened really early um, that year, I told myself like, just go out and drive slowly and see what it's like, because you're gonna have to learn anyway. Luckily, everything in Ames, um, no matter where you go, is like 15 minutes, you're outside of, on the border of Ames, so you're not really driving too far realistically if you live in Ames to get to school every day. Um, and most of the people here have lived in this weather and kind of know how to navigate it. Um, it's just a learning curve and you'll get through it. It's difficult, but you'll survive. If I can survive the winter being in from Florida and uh, Maya being from California, then you can do it too. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Gordon. So specifically regarding tornadoes, um, I'm north of 50 years old and lived in the Midwest all but seven years of my entire life. And until last summer, I have never seen a tornado. Um, the, the, the warning systems are very good here. Um, they're much better than they used to be. I mean, you can sit on your TV and watch the radar systems and they can tell you exactly where it's at and when it's going to hit a particular area. So don't fret about the tornadoes. The cold weather is a real thing um, and it happens every year. It, but don't, don't not come to Iowa because of tornadoes because the risk of hitting, I don't know if we've had a tornado in this area of Ames in over 15 years. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so we are out of time, but I do, um, I'm gonna ask if you wouldn't mind sticking around for one last question. Um, and actually the, the students and faculty um, in the Q&A box, there's two more questions that we didn't get to. If somebody wants to type answers to those questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you kind of have some insight there um, as we're wrapping up. But the question that I, I hope that you guys might answer as a way of farewell um, is, so these students that are listening right now are either heading into veterinary school at Iowa State or hopefully somewhere else. 
what would be your piece of advice for that? Um, not only is it important, you know, financially, of course, you know, make the smart choice and try to decrease your loan amounts if you can, but go where it makes you happy. You know, um, if the West Coast calls your name, sure. You know, if Ames has the programs that you want and like, you know, the quality of education here, um, then this is the place for you. But don't sacrifice, you know, your education based on finances. Of course, money is important and you don't want to be in a ton of debt, but there are definitely um, loan repayment options, things like that, that you can look into to help decrease your loan. Um, I also donate plasma to help decrease that. So like, you know, there are ways to work around finances, but just do, you know, the things that make you happy, the location that makes you happy and the education that will benefit you the most. Dr. Musser, do you want to take it away with a word of farewell and advice? Sure, absolutely. So I would say one of the most important things for me was to learn some self-empathy, which is really difficult to do. Um, but vet school is really tough in a variety of ways. And so you're not always going to get the A that you got in undergrad. And so just realizing that that's okay, and it's okay not to study 24-7. You shouldn't study 24-7. As our students were saying, you need an outlet. You need to do something that you love to help balance out that studying and the rest of your life, and really taking that to heart and doing that. I think most of us are type A. We all want to study. We all want to get straight A's. And that would be lovely and wonderful, but we may not. And so just practicing a bit of self-empathy, I think, is really important. Great. Dr. Gordon? Um, yeah, two things. Number one, this is a very, this is an incredible profession. Um, when you complete your degree as a DVM, you have so many opportunities. And it's, it's unlimited and you can even change directions in three or four or five years or, or longer um, because of the background and training you have. It's so diverse. Um, I, I will also add to the, the studying and the worrying about your GPA. Um, with the exception of applying back here at Iowa State, nobody's ever asked me my GPA once I got out of school. Um, and I've hired many veterinarians in private practice and I've never asked that. Um, to me, it's a being able to demonstrate competence. Um, and that comes from just being involved in the program, learning what you learn in the first three years, applying it in the fourth year, um, having good communication skills, and uh, being a well-rounded person. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Jody. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been replying to some of the chat questions. What am I answering right now? <laughs> uh, just a little bit of uh, advice uh, as a way of farewell, a little bit of advice for the first year or students coming into their first year. Yeah, definitely come in. Guns a blazing. It's, it's fun. It's hard, but it'll be the best experience of your life. Um, it's an adjustment for sure, but once you get into a routine, you know, vet school's hard, but once you get into a routine, you kind of get in the groove of things and things start to fall into place. So it's really, it's a challenge, but it'll all be worth it in the end. Great, Bianca, have you gotten a chance to answer yet? Sorry, I had to step away. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, I would say keep an open mind. Um, that's how I came into vet school. Um, I always knew I was interested in small animal medicine, but I just know that a lot of times people will just 180 change what they want to do. Um, so I did keep an open mind, joined lots of clubs that I don't really have much of an interest in, um, like the cow club, um, you know, love my cow people, but it's just not for me. Um, but did get a lot of exposure um, in that way. And I think that's the best way to go. Don't come to vet school thinking that you're definitely going to do what you think you're going to do right now because it might change and that's okay um, because every field needs people that like what they're doing and love what they're doing so open-mindedness is my advice. Fantastic who's left Maya? Um, I 
Yes, I mean, going off of what everyone has said, keep an open mind. It is an adjustment. It is hard. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. That was one thing personally for me that took me the longest to be willing to do. In undergrad, I was very independent and I was able to find things and answer things on my own and didn't really contact my professors. But in vet school, if you are struggling and you don't understand a concept, ask your classmates, ask your professors, ask upperclassmen. We've all been through it. They've all been through it. We all want to help each other. So don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone to get the help that, or seek that information that you need. Fantastic. And Kieran, did you get a chance to give your advice to? Yeah, I'll just add a little quick thing. Obviously, everyone else has been talking about, you know, keeping an open mind. Uh, coming into vet school, I honestly never wanted to touch a horse ever again. Uh, but here I am, and my girlfriend owns two mares. So, you know, what can you do? Um, but also kind of, you know, get out of the classroom. Uh, obviously, studying, you're going to learn all of your concepts and things like that. But through your organizations, that's where you're going to get a lot of the hands-on uh, experiences. So, you know, there be a various wet labs, speakers coming in, talking to speakers, you know, that lets you expand your network tremendously. I've uh, gotten pretty close and had some like one-on-one -on -one connections with uh, speakers that have just come in for you know, a random lunch meeting uh, through some organizations. So um, always put yourself out there and uh, do great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Dean Grooms walked in and needed a picture of me and our, our lovely crew. So if you show up on his Twitter later, you'll know why. <laughs> so that's why I was like waving around all crazy. Thank you guys so much for your advice. Uh, thank you for those of you who were able to join us today. So thanks for our, to our panel, but also to our attendees. Um, I just put in the chat a link to our Facebook virtual tour. Um, so unfortunately that won't be live today, but we did it uh, about a year and a half or so ago. Um, and that is up on our Facebook uh, page. So you can uh, see that for those students who unfortunately can't be here in person to, to take a walk around our uh, school. So thank you again to, your, to the panel. Uh, thank you for those of you who tuned in and we will go ahead and sign off. As a reminder, this will be recorded and up on Monday or Tuesday. So thanks guys.